Today's reading is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 1 to 10. Paul, Silas and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Archaea. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Archaea. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven who was raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Thank you for our reading. Today, Noah is going to be speaking to us, so I'm just going to pray for Noah before he speaks. Dear God, thank you for knowing what he has to say. We pray for everyone listening that they have ears open to hear your message. Amen. Hi, my name is Noah, and I'm one of the youth here at St Saviour's, and today I'm going to be leading the talk. Today we're going to be looking at the passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1 to 10. So before we start, we're just going to watch a quick clip from the Bible project. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. This is most likely the earliest letter that we have from Paul, and the backstory for it is found in the book of Acts. It's where Paul and his co-worker Silas went to the ancient Greek city of Thessalonica. And after just one month of telling people the good news about Jesus, a large number of Jewish and Greek people gave their allegiance to Jesus, and they formed the first church community there. But trouble was brewing. Paul's announcement of the risen Jesus as the true Lord of the world, it led to suspicion. So the Christians in Thessalonica were eventually accused of defying Caesar, the Roman emperor, when they said that there is another king, Jesus. And this led to a persecution that got so intense, Paul and Silas actually had to flee from the city. And this was painful for them because they loved the people there so much. And so this letter is Paul's attempt to reconnect with the Christians in Thessalonica after he got a report from Timothy that they were doing more than okay, they were flourishing despite this intense persecution. He designed the letter to have two main movements. First is a celebration of their faithfulness to Jesus, and then he challenges them to keep growing as followers of Jesus. And then these two movements are surrounded by three prayers. The letter opens with a thanksgiving prayer. The two movements are linked together by a transitional prayer, and then the whole thing is concluded with a final prayer. It's a beautiful design. Paul opens by giving thanks and celebrating the Thessalonians' faith, their love for others, and their hope in Jesus despite persecution. He goes on to retell the story of their conversion, how they used to be idolatrous polytheists, and they were living in a culture where all of life was permeated by institutions and practices that honored the Greek and Roman gods. And Paul talks about how they turned away from those idols to serve the living and true God, and that they're now waiting for the coming of God's Son from heaven. So in a city like Thessalonica, transferring your allegiance to the creator God of Israel and to King Jesus, this came at a cost. Isolation from your neighbors, hostility from your family. But for the Thessalonians, the overwhelming love of Jesus who died for them and the hope of his return, it made it all worth it. 
Paul then retells the story of his mission in Thessalonica and of the dear friendships he formed with the people. He uses really intimate metaphors here. They treated him like their child, and he became like their mother and like their father. He says, we were happy to share with you not only the good news from God, but our very selves, because we came to dearly love you. Paul reminds us here that the essence of Christian leadership is not about power and having influence. It's about healthy relationships and humble, loving service. He reminds them that he never asked for money. He simply came to love and serve them in the name of Jesus. And so Paul moves on to reflect on their common persecution. Just like Jesus was rejected and killed by his own people, so now Paul is persecuted by his fellow Jews, and the Thessalonians are facing hostility from their Greek neighbors. And Paul draws a strange comfort from knowing that together their sufferings are a way of participating in the story of Jesus' own life and death. Paul then shares about the anguish he experienced when he heard of the hardships the Thessalonians had after he and Silas fled. So he sent Timothy to support them and see how they were doing. And to his joy, Timothy discovered that they were going strong. They were faithful to Jesus. They were full of love for God and their neighbors. And they longed to see Paul as much as he longed to see them. And so Paul concludes with a prayer for endurance. And what's cool is that he introduces here the topics he's going to address in the letter's second half. He prays that God will grow their capacity to love, that he'll strengthen their commitment to holiness as they fix their hope on the return of King Jesus. So he opens the letter's second movement by challenging them to a life that's consistent with the teachings of Jesus. So this means, first of all, a serious commitment to holiness and sexual purity. In contrast to the promiscuous, sexually destructive culture around them, they are to follow Jesus' teaching about experiencing the beauty and the power of sex within the haven of a committed marriage covenant relationship. God takes sexual misbehavior seriously, Paul says. It dishonors and destroys people and their dignity. Following Jesus also means a commitment to loving and serving others. So Paul instructs them that Christians should be known in the city as reliable people who work really hard, not just to make money, but so that they can have resources to provide for themselves and to generously share with people who are in need. After this, Paul addresses a number of questions the Thessalonians had raised about the future hope of Jesus' return. So some Christians in the church had recently died, most likely killed as martyrs, and their friends and family are wondering about their fate when Jesus returns. And so Paul makes it clear that despite their grief and loss, not even death can separate Christians from the love of Jesus. When he returns as king, he will call both the living and the dead to himself. And Paul uses a really cool image here. He uses language language that would normally describe how a city subject to the Roman Caesar would send out a delegation to welcome or meet his arrival. Paul then applies this imagery to the arrival of King Jesus. He too will be greeted by a delegation of his people who will go to meet the Lord in the air as they welcome and escort him back to this world where he'll establish his kingdom of justice and peace. Paul then wants the Thessalonians to see how this hope should motivate faithfulness to Jesus. So he pokes fun at the famous Roman propaganda that it's Caesar who brings peace and security. Of course, Rome's peace came through violence, through enslaving their enemies and military occupation. And Paul warns that Jesus will return as king one day and confront this kind of injustice. Followers of King Jesus should live in the present as if that future day is already here. Despite the nighttime of human evil around them, they should stay sober and awake as the light of God's kingdom dawns here on earth as it is in heaven. Paul closes all of these exhortations like he began with a hopeful prayer, that God would permeate their lives with his holiness, that he would set them apart to be completely devoted and blameless until the return of King Jesus. 1 Thessalonians reminds us that from the very beginning, following Jesus as king has produced a truly countercultural or holy way of life. And this will sometimes generate suspicion and conflict among our neighbors. But the response of Jesus' followers to such hostility should always be love, meeting opposition with grace and generosity. And this way of life, it's motivated by hope in the coming kingdom of Jesus that has already begun in his resurrection from the dead. And so holiness, love, and future hope, that's what First Thessalonians is all about. 
So the story behind this passage is Paul is writing a letter to the Thessalonians to commend them for their faith and also encourage them in their trials. So in Acts 17, we learn that Paul and his companions started up a church in Thessalonica by reasoning with the people in the synagogue, which gained many followers. Sadly, he had to leave the church and abandon it because a mob was forced against him. So we can learn a lot from the Thessalonians' faith and their devotion to God. So firstly, it says in verse three, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. This means that they are not only saying they believe, but acting on, that, on their faith and doing the work to show the love of God. They are also enduring this persecution, knowing there is hope because Jesus gives them the hope they need to get through the tough times. Also in verse four and five, it says, for we know brothers and sisters loved by God that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction, you know how we lived among you for your sake. So firstly, this church was mainly made up of Greeks and perhaps their faith was being questioned and that they were saying they, they weren't chosen and their faith wasn't real. So this is then contradicted when Paul says, you are chosen by God, meaning they are wanted and God has a plan for them. Paul also says, our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction, showing us that God is not only using those words to empower them and remind them that they, it is not made up and they are having a big impact on society. In verse eight, it says, the Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith, your faith in God has become known everywhere Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. This shows how powerful the word of God is and also the fact they were persecuted and they still managed to get the word out to everyone, which is really amazing and really does show them how powerful their faith was. So the thing I love about the Bible is it's so relevant in today's life, like this letter. We probably face situations like this in our everyday lives and it's always great to know that people who lived 2000 years ago still face the problems that we have. Now I'd like to point out how lucky we are. We get the right to have our own faith and go to church, but in some countries this is not the case. Some countries don't have the right to their own faith. They have no rights to education and are accused of blasphemy. In some cases owning a Bible can get them executed and they are always on constant watch. And also, in the worst cases, churches are bombed. But despite that, these people still come to Christ and still read the Bible every day. And that is amazing and really does show the power of God. So even though our faith isn't life-threatening, we can still face persecution in, our to in today's lives. Now, I just want you to close your eyes and think about these questions that I'm going to ask you. What would you do if you were persecuted like the Thessalonians? Would you push through or would you give up hope? How could you be more like those Thessalonians and preach out amongst that persecution? Or are you struggling to live out your own faith? And finally, how can you show the love to those who aren't Christians? Now, based on those answers you thought of in your head, try think of how you can make your week an example of the Thessalonians' faith.